Uh, hello, webinar attendees. My name is Marisol Morales, and I serve as the Vice President for Network Leadership with Campus Compact. We're so happy to have you as part of our uh, Campus Compact National Webinar Series. Um, today's webinar is Students and Spirituality, Student Motivation to Do Good. And we have um, our presenters uh, from Interfaith Youth Corps, Janet Cordovas, Co-Curricular Partnership Manager, uh, and Lisa Davidson, Assessment Research uh, manager. Uh, in addition, we have Amanda Best from Carnegie Mellon University and Natalie Furlett, our very own Illinois Campus Compact Executive Director. Um, I'll be introducing the presenters shortly, but before I begin, I just want to remind folks of the other webinars that we have in the series. Um, if you haven't signed up, you can go to compact.org and sign up for the additional webinars we have uh, coming up. The next one will be in February, and there's a full list of all of our webinars for the rest of the year on our website. Uh, I also want to plug the Campus Compact, Compact Nation podcast, our bi-weekly podcast series, which is hosted by uh, our president, Andrew Seligson, the executive director of uh, Iowa and Minnesota Campus Compact, Emily Shields, and myself. Uh, you can go to uh, Compact Nation uh, and find it on any podcast listening um, app that you use. Um, so now let me introduce Janet and Lisa. Uh, Lisa Davidson is Assessment and Research Manager at Interfaith Youth Corps, better known as IFYC. Uh, she works with campuses on a variety of efforts related to assessing effectiveness of interfaith programs, understanding the campus climate for religious, spiritual, and secular diversity. She also supports national research partnerships between IFYC and scholars who investigate interfaith learning and development among undergraduate students. Lisa's own research examines the type of learning and development that results from undergraduates intercultural engagement with a special focus on inclusive, inclusive measurements of this. Janet Cordovas is the co-curricular partnership manager uh, and she equips and empowers campus professionals to, to be interfaith leaders. Prior to joining IFYC, Cordovas worked in higher education for 13 years, serving in various roles, including student support services, such as residence life and crisis response, as well as in academic initiatives with first year seminars, orientations, and senior experience courses. Cordovas has recently completed her doctorate, congratulations, uh, in ethical leadership, and successfully defended her research on the influence of spirituality on first-generation college students' level of grit and equanimity. In her spare time, she volunteers with Chicago Scholars and the Food Pantry. Natalie Furlett is currently the Executive Director of Illinois Campus Compact, a partnership between 34 Illinois colleges and universities uh, dedicated to upholding the public purposes of higher education. Prior to joining the Illinois Campus Compact, uh, Natalie spent time building student community ties at Northwestern as the coordinator of student community service before taking on the role of associate director of the Norris Center for Student Involvement. As the coordinator of student community services, Natalie received the Outstanding Community Service Award from the Department of Student Affairs for her work with National MS Society. Also with us is Nancy, uh, Mandy Best, sorry. Uh, Mandy Best's sixth year, is, this is her sixth year serving as the House Fellow and Coordinator of Spirituality and Interfaith Initiatives at Carnegie Mellon University. Prior to arriving at CMU, Mandy completed her Master's of Education at Slippery Rock University of Pennsylvania and her BS in Psychology at Geneva College. Outside of work, Mandy enjoys making quilts, spending times outdoor with her husband, Ty, their son, Jack, and their 95 pound rescue dog, Murray. Welcome all of you, and we're so excited and happy to have um, this webinar as part of our series, um, and I'll let you begin, thanks. Good morning, Marisol, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so excited to be in this space with you. Um, I know um, Lisa and I have been thinking through this and wanting to discuss for students and spirituality and the motivation to do good for, for many months. Um, but before we dive into today's content for the webinar, I just want to take a minute to tell you a little bit more about our work, um, specifically Lisa and I's at Interfaith Youth Corps, also known as IFYC, um, and kind of the spaces that we get to, to be in and the work that we get to think about on a daily basis. Um, so, like Marisol said, my work uh, predominantly focuses on building interfaith cooperation, religious literacy, and religious diversity capacity among staff and, and faculty. 
How that manifests is through working through innovation grants, thinking through programmatic initiatives, thinking through courses and embedding interfaith learning outcomes within those spaces, um, working with uh, residential life staff, staff in multicultural affairs, Women's Resource Center, and thinking about students' holistic development. Um, and so I've been at IFYC for a year and a half, and um, I've been able to connect with many Compass Contact uh, staff as well in thinking through our um, our work and where and where those those civic outcomes and the interfaith cooperation intersect. So I'm very grateful to be in this space and I look forward to spending our time together. Great, and good day to everyone as well. Um, it's a pleasure to be here talking with all of you. It's a pleasure to be presenting with my friend and colleague, Dr. Cordovez. Um, I, as uh, Marcel introduced, uh, I'm Lisa Davidson. I'm our assessment and research manager here at Interfaith Youth Corps. Um, and that means I do two things. Um, I help support um, our campus partners, we work with colleges across the country, I help support them um, in their assessment efforts. So I help them understand um, how to think about effective interfaith programming, the kind of learning and development uh, that are required to actualize some of the civic outcomes that some of you all are working toward. Um, as Janet mentioned, how interfaith cooperation um, aligns with some of those civic outcomes. I also help campuses uh, prioritize understanding their campus climate for religious, spiritual, and secular diversity. So um, helping them understand the kinds of questions that they might ask, uh, the kinds of information they might want to collect uh, to learn about that. I also, as Marisol mentioned, help support our national research projects. You're going to hear me talk a little bit about some of our research findings, uh, just a tiny bit about those, um, but broadly speaking, we, we seek to understand uh, the impact of college on students' interfaith learning and development. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but looking forward to jumping in, um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Janet. Got it. So there's so many things that Lisa and I would want to share with you and, and um, just kind of highlight um, for our time together, but with our brief time today, we've decided to focus on two things. One, in lifting up the role that where interfaith cooperation as it relates to promoting civic outcomes, so specifically our work in religious diversity, religious literacy, seeking a world where interfaith cooperation is a social norm, and finding and highlighting the spaces that promote civic outcomes. Um, so that's one. And then second is really to engage with you all in this space um, and reflect and share ideas that help us integrate that information, the information that we're learning today. And so since we are a pretty large group, the only really strategic and effective way of doing that is utilizing the chat box. So as we uh, dive into some of the findings or we um, kind of nuance some of the information, please utilize the chat box to share what is going on on your campus and some of the programs that you are leading or working through that intersect uh, civic engagement and interfaith cooperation. Um, with that, um, I'd love to hear from Natalie from Compass Compact, just a few words on this partnership and the work that we're doing together. Great, thank you both so much. Um, so, you know, Campus Compact and Interfaith Youth Corps kind of see each other in the same spaces quite often. And as Chicago-based organizations, Janet and I were running into each other as well and mutual friends and seeing each other in, uh, in different spaces. And so we started talking about sort of what it meant for Campus Compact and IFYC to really think about who we are as partners. Um, and so a couple of things came through with that. One is that there are some real similarities in our mission, which basically believe in the power of college students to make really big social civic change. Um, and so how could we build on that to create some content that would be helpful to our campuses? Um, and then also, one of the things I hear quite often as I go around to campuses and meet with folks is that we're always looking for ways to really identify with students and their motivation to do the work that that we're asking them to be part of. So why do they want to, to participate civically in their communities? Why do they want to participate in service learning? Why are they interested in the co-curricular um, opportunities? And really, um, religious and spiritual life is one of those answers. And so um, Janet and Lisa have done some great research on those um, questions and, and thought this was a great forum to introduce some of that to you all. Um, and then lastly, IFYC just has so many amazing resources that campus compact uh, campuses can use on their 
uh, on their campus. They may not already have IFYSB chapters or um, they might just not have the opportunity to work with them. So we thought this was a great opportunity to introduce IFYC and some of the resources available. Um, so that was sort of our motivation behind trying to um, find some space to do this. And we hope to you know, have many partnerships as we move forward. Thank you, Natalie. I really appreciate that. And, and I do love that we are both situated in Chicago. <laughs> um, so with that, I just want to take a minute to tell you a little bit about Interfaith Youth Corps. Um, it is a nonprofit that's located in Chicago um, that works toward creating a world where interfaith cooperation is a social norm. How we achieve that, how we aspire to that, how we work to create that world varies um, um, through assessment and research, as is Lisa's uh, area of expertise, student leadership, curriculum development, online trainings, accountability groups, grants, partnerships just like this one, et cetera, et cetera. So we look at doing this work within higher education really from a multi-prong approach. Um, and specifically, we work in higher education for a variety of reasons. Um, first, campuses are a microcosm of broader society, and as such, religious conflicts arise. Students take up and respond to issues that happen globally, such as Israel and Palestine, the refugee crisis, internment camps in China, ethnic cleansing over Hindu Muslims in Miramar, women in Denmark banned from wearing niacobs. Like the rest of American society, campuses are becoming increasingly religiously diverse and students' religious and non-religious identities inform their college experience. What occurs on our campuses influences civic society and what occurs in society impacts our, our campuses. Second, higher education, particularly in North America, has a long track record of setting civic priorities for the country. From the civil rights movement to feminism, from environmentalism to multiculturalism, many social norms and movements have originated within higher education and then moved into society at large. Thus, campuses are an important place to foster intentional engagement across these lines of religious difference in order to build community. It is a site for network building. It is a site in which intentional relationships can be built across lines of difference that can serve as both a training ground and a launching pad for similar work in society at large. Third reason that we specifically focus in in higher education and partner with higher ed is that campuses produce, curate, and make meaning out of knowledge. I mean, you are in this ecosystem. This unique ecosystem of higher education is a primary site where the work of reflecting on who we are as a society takes place and where professionals like yourselves help support and guide these students. This is such a unique time in, uh, in anyone's development. It's this opportunity to really, what is it, the Socratic aphorism of know thyself, and with professionals like yourself surrounding students that, that help make meaning, that help ask these questions, um, and that really impact our society when they leave us. Fourth, campus graduates, campuses graduate a critical mass of civic leaders who go on to direct and set the priorities of various other segments of society, from businesses to government, the work of liberal arts is to train students to become engaged global citizens and to be empowered to deal with the complexity of the world. Religion is a powerful player in the world. Civic engagement and leadership now require an attention to religious diversity as well as skills for interfaith cooperation, such as in education, business, healthcare, human resources. I mean, for instance, a medical doctor who is religiously literate would be equipped and know about religious parameters surrounding surgical procedures, blood infusions, and so forth for specific religious groups. An interfaith teacher would accommodate students who kept Shabbat, provide food options that welcome Jain believers, and provide prayer spaces and times for Salit to support their Muslim students. IFYC is specifically in this space because of the religious landscape and the shift in the, in the U.S. So in 1976, 81% of U.S. identified as white and of Christian denomination. In 2016, 43% of U.S. identified as white and Christian. So there's a big change from 1976 to 2016. And yes, that is the U.S. religious landscape, but as I just mentioned, what happens in civic society is happening on our campuses as well as the non-religious and unaffiliated have tripled. There's a rise in black Protestant and evangelical Christians. 
the Muslim population continues to grow. And so really this religious, spiritual, and secular diversity are a part of civic life where there are laws and policies and holidays. We also ask our students to bring their whole selves. And so let's stop asking our students to leave their religious, spiritual, secular way of making meaning at the door. And let's ha actually incorporate it into their holistic development. So things to consider is that the U.S. is the most religiously diverse country in the world. Diversity in itself doesn't guarantee that people will get along or interact with one another. We can say there are diverse perspectives. We can say there's a diverse group of students here in this room, but we know nothing about the engagement. This is critical on college campuses as diversity continues to grow. And if we don't consider engaging this diversity, our communities will continue to be polarized, right? If they aren't already, where our students don't even engage with the other and begin util utilizing terms that are, that are dehumanizing of each other because we haven't been engaging this diversity. And, and if we don't engage this diversity, fear and misunderstanding will continue to increase, evolve and continue to polarize just as a society moving past our campuses. For instance, just a few weeks ago, students cited faith as the reason for kneeling during the national anthem in protest of racism and Notre Dame. Religion, spirituality, and secularism are intersecting and influencing our students and society. And we as professionals need to be prepared for these conversations and to cultivate it and to nourish it. Um, if you know of any incidents impacting you and your university that intersect this civic engagement and interfaith cooperation, please write them into the chat box and or link in an article or post so that we can all um, be aware and, and learn together. Great, thanks so much, Janet. Now that Janet has um laid out who IFYC is, where we do our work, and most importantly, why we do our work. Um, I wanna switch gears just a little bit and talk about, uh, situate IFYC's work uh, among many of you on here uh, who are also prioritizing civic outcomes and civic learning. Um, so let's talk about how higher education prioritizes civic outcomes. First of all, it was very um, interesting to read through the chats to see the various areas from which you all are coming. So I saw a lot of community-based learning. I saw um, some chaplaincy and religious uh, and spiritual life uh, and a variety of other areas. So I probably don't need to tell anyone on this webinar um, that A, higher education does prioritize civic outcomes, um, but B, what some of those outcomes may be. Um, so I have a couple of examples here, um, certainly from Campus Compact and other champions of these civic outcomes. Um, the Association of American Colleges and Universities, for instance, um, has advanced essential learning outcomes that really prepare students to engage, as Janet described, uh, as global citizens, right? What does it mean to understand and interact um, across the world? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So I wanna thank you all for the work that you're doing to help promote these, but I also wanna use this time to sort of situate how we at IFYC um, understand um, our call to do some of that work as well. So let's talk about how IFYC understands this. Just like the groups I mentioned a moment ago who set the agenda for some of higher education civic purposes, such as Campus Compact, such as AACNU, NASPA, ACPA, and others, um, such as those groups, um, IFYC also seeks to promote civic learning on college campuses. So how do we do this? We understand our work in terms of cultivating pluralism. In particular, given the religious and secular diversity within the US, how some of that is changing, as Janet mentioned a bit ago, we emphasize the civic importance of pluralism. So many of you probably have your own definitions of this term of pluralism, but let's unpack how IFYC understands this and how it could relate to your work. First, let's start at the top. There's a lot of diagrams on here, but the sociologist Peter Berger has argued that modernity or life in this modern age um, really brings folks together in ways that were not possible before. Right? We have, we can uh, Skype with people overseas. We have global classrooms now. We can pick up the phone, get in a car, get on an airplane, right? Back in the day, 
uh, we could not have those types of interactions. So for the most part, um, without that technology and without that transportation, folks really hung together in their own cultural groups, right? There wasn't as much uh, inherent interaction. So Peter Berger's work has been extremely informative for us in the sense that right here, right now, whether or not we're seeking this out, we're inherently interacting across difference. Next, if we go over um, down into the left, we draw on the work of Diana Eck, a religious studies scholar who is founder and president of Harvard's Pluralism Project to differentiate diversity, as Janet described, and pluralism. Right, diversity is a fact. So diversity is literally bringing different groups, different identities together. It's usually talked about in terms of a numerical reality on any given college campus. Religious pluralism, however, in, as Janet mentioned, involves the productive engagement of that diversity. So we can draw on Diana X definition of religious pluralism as the active engagement of diversity to a positive end. So IFYC puts these definitions into motion by our concept of interfaith cooperation. So if pluralism is the goal, interfaith cooperation can be understood as the path to get there. But what exactly is interfaith cooperation? So you'll see the diagram on the lower right involves three aspects. First things first, respect. People have a right to form their own identities regarding religion, spirituality, secularity, or really anything else. They also have a right to express their identities and be reasonably accommodated. But respect and accommodation for all identities, certainly we know this, it certainly does not mean we each must agree with or even accept particular traditions, values, or beliefs. So I'm going to talk in just a moment about what students must learn in order to do what is sometimes this very difficult work. The second component of interfaith cooperation is relationships. Since people have a right to form and express their identities, we all know and or can imagine that these various expressions um, can undoubtedly result in conflict sometimes. We can see this in our society in many places. We turn on the news at night and certainly see this. We could see it on our campuses. Much of IFYC's work relates to this on college campuses. So while respect in these situations in times of conflict, while respect is certainly necessary, it's not enough. We can respect and accommodate while having little else to do with others. So when divergent views arise without relationships, which is the second component, the potential for continued conflict remains high. Diversity is not a problem to be overcome or simply tolerated or accommodated. A diverse society requires positive, constructive, and cooperative interactions. And again, I'm going to speak in just a minute about what students have to learn in order to do this important work. Finally, common action. Common action for the common good. Common good can be understood as principles and structures that a range of groups benefit from, and people generally agree that we have a collective interest to uphold. Think of benefiting, for instance, the health of the whole, issues like poverty, food security, taking care of the environment, even, vo even voting rights. This is complicated since individuals' identities often shape their vision of what is common in the notion of common good. But when opportunities arise that allow diverse groups to come together based on shared aspects of their faith, their spirituality, perhaps their philosophies, um, such as a concern for others' well-being, that might be the point that brings us all together, right? We have differences, but we can agree that we have a collective concern for others' well-being. More people directly benefit. And this also relates to the type of opportunities that promote important aspects of students' learning, which I'm going to get into right now. So as I mentioned, um, pluralism is the goal. Interfaith cooperation is the path to get there. So how do we how do we promote the kind of learning and development that are necessary for students to have respect, to relate across difference, and to come together to work toward the common good? So Ibu Patel, our president and founder of Interfaith Youth Corps, several years back, um, drew from social science research and uh, advanced this concept of the interfaith triangle, which you see in front of you. And it's pretty straightforward for those of you versed in intercultural communication or perhaps some other bodies of literature, but let me just talk about how this works and why we use it. So first things first, these three areas are interrelated, meaning one tends to inform the others and vice versa. So effective interfaith programs, so when we work with campus partners, one of the reasons we use this model is to make sure that folks understand in order to do interfaith cooperation, in order to develop pluralistic orientations, this is actually what we need to be teaching our students how to do, right? So we can start down the lower left, knowledge. This is oftentimes referred to as a component of religious literacy. 
it's literally the factual information about particular religious, spiritual, or secular traditions. It's culture specific information, right? So it's history, uh, it's the values, beliefs, and traditions, contemporary realities of those groups, right? We know that the more we learn that information, we go to the right, the more it influences appreciative or positive attitudes about those groups, right? And that is because we know as we learn intercultural knowledge, it disrupts stereotypes and prejudice, and we have to sort of center our assumptions when we learn more information. Um, and we know that that positively relates to increases in, in appreciative attitudes. We know if we have more favorable attitudes toward particular groups, right, it relates to our ability to effectively interact or relate at the top of the uh, triangle to those groups. We also know that as we relate more and more across difference, we learn more. We think about your own interactions at meetings or over lunch, these informal or formal uh, kinds of interaction across difference, right? We learn about holiday traditions. We learn about life events. We learn about how various groups understand the current realities that are happening, um, right? And that informs our knowledge and around and around the triangle we go. Um, so that is really how we kind of operationalize interfaith cooperation. But let's connect this to some of your work. So we've talked about pluralism and we talked about interfaith cooperation, but what is this all good for, right? So because we're in a space that is centering civic outcomes and civic learning, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the civic goods of pluralism. So some of this may be uh, more intuitive uh, than other points, but let's dig into the long-term impact of pluralism, in particular, uh, the type of pluralism that we're talking about at IFYC. What's the long-term impact on society? So we can understand this in five ways. First things first, as I just explained through our interfaith triangle, um, one of the civic outcomes or civic goods of pluralism is more understanding and less prejudice. As I explained, um, the more that we learn about specific cultures and groups, right, the more appreciative attitudes uh, and less prejudice we tend to develop. Why is this a civic priority? Prejudice violates the, the dignity and rights of individuals and serves as a barrier to their contributions to a broader society. So as we promote increased understanding, appreciative attitudes increase while prejudicial feelings and stereotypical thinking decrease. Secondly, we can understand pluralism in terms of strengthening social cohesion. Social cohesion is the willingness of individuals in a society to cooperate with one another, generally speaking, to keep the society going, right, to survive and to do well. We know that identity-based conflicts represent significant aspects of our society. Social cohesion helps prevent such conflicts. Social cohesion respects and accommodates diverse identities, it nurtures positive relationships between communities, and it supports the broader societies we live in. Social cohesion creates the condition for what is third, and that's bridged social capital. So we can think of social capital, it's a phrase we throw around a lot, but have we stopped to unpack what it means? We can think of social capital as organized networks of people who live and work in a society, enabling any given society to function at its best, right, to kind of sustain itself. In the U.S., believe it or not, religious communities are the, religious communities are the largest source of social capital, right? That's pretty profound. So we might think in terms of social capital, if we think about particular groups, that's oftentimes referred to as bonded social capital, right? We create bonds within our same communities, identity-based communities. If we bridge that social capital, that bonded capital and create bridge social capital between diverse religious, spiritual, and secular communities, we channel this toward a positive civic purpose. Think about the profound impact on social problems we can have if we work not only within our various traditions and groups, but across. Fourth, uh, the fourth civic good is continuity of identity communities. Particular identity communities are losing members. The consequences of this, right, we think about the value of identity specific communities, sense of belonging, affirmation, all of the support um, in good functioning that happens within identity communities. So we know that as those communities can shrink, the consequences are immense. They involve personal, emotional, professional uh, consequences many times. Identity communities also serve as the building blocks for social capital, which we just talked about, right? This bonded social capital that happens in groups if we seek to bridge that. So without identity communities, social capital um, can really suffer. A key challenge that identity communities face, however, involves positively engaging that diversity. Lastly, uh, one of the civic goods of pluralism is about binding narratives for diverse communities. 
The idea that the U.S. is an immigrant nation in a place where out of many, one, or e pluribus unum, as many of us know from our great seal here in the U.S., should give people of diverse backgrounds a sense of place and belonging here in our country. Some of the most enduring images of the U.S., including, for instance, Abraham Lincoln's remarks, those made by Martin Luther King Jr., and several other uh, religious, political, and social leaders have roots in religious texts and narratives. These symbols, when used appropriately, can communicate a national narrative that communicates the significance of such diversity, but that also prioritizes appreciating, protecting it, and positively engaging it. So we're going to switch gears now that we've talked about um, a little bit about our background. We've talked about uh, our goal of civic pluralism. We've talked about the civic goods of that and interfaith cooperation. Um, the research part of me is going to switch gears and talk about a tiny bit of what we've learned. And I say a tiny bit uh, because uh, I'll just get into uh, the research aspect of my job. I'm involved with our national research projects. I'm going to present just a few findings from our IDEALS project. IDEALS is quite a mouthful <laughs> of an acronym. It stands for Interfaith Diversity Experiences and Attitudes Longitudinal Survey. No one should say that. <laughs> no one should say that three times fast. Um, but the IDEALS project, um, it is a longitudinal project that has been following entering first year college students across the US uh, since 2015. So these students are now in their fourth year of college. We've collected survey data from them at the very beginning of their first year of college as soon as they entered. We collected survey data again from students at the end of their first year. We are going to collect data a third time from these students at the end of this academic year. And we have also done some qualitative work um, with educators and students on campuses to unpack a little bit more of the why behind some of our survey findings. So you can see we have quite a few responses. We started with over 20,000 students, first year students, over 120 institutions. Um, essentially, uh, the sort of $10 million question we're trying to understand is what's the impact of college on students' interfaith learning and development? And in order to do that, we examine the impact of climate, campus climate, and the ways in which students engage or not, formally, informally, co-curricularly, curricularly, uh, we examine the impact of all that on various developmental outcomes. I'm not going to drill down too much here on what I'm displaying to the right, but when I say developmental outcomes, this is the stuff we're looking at. So appreciative knowledge, appreciative attitudes, self-authored worldview commitment, which involves uh, students' ability to sort of question or interrogate their own identities, uh, incorporate various perspectives into their own understanding of who they are. And then finally, pluralism. And for purposes of today's conversation, I'm only highlighting two aspects of that, which are global citizenship and commitment to interfaith leadership and service, given our audience for today. As so, Lisa, uh, sorry to jump in, Lisa. Yeah. Um, as Lisa um, start, begins to share some of these select findings with you all, um, I'm going to keep an eye on our chat box because we'd really love to see what's resonating with you and how this shows up on your campus. Um, and or if questions come up. So that way when we begin to wrap up our time together, if there are questions, we can make sure to lift those up and address them. So um, as Lisa's going through the findings, I'll be keeping an eye on the chat box. So that way it's a little bit of a conversation in this virtual space. Great, thanks Janet, you got it. So the first, we're gonna present just a couple findings, but the first finding uh, that we know from looking at students' uh, responses at the outset of college, and then again at the second, or again at the end of their first year rather, is that we know that particular types of civic engagement drop between high school and the first year of college. And we can, let me put my visual up here. Here we go. Um, so we can see the blue is their high school engagement, the orange is their first year of college engagement, and we know, for instance, uh, again, a handful of civic uh, engagement opportunities, working together with others of diverse religious and secular perspectives on a service project, for instance. Remember, we heard from over 20,000 students at the outset of their college experience, right? So it's a pretty nationally representative sample. Uh, nearly half of them reported doing this in high school. Only about a third reported doing this um, during their first year of college, right? Uh, we see the most pronounced difference related to our community service measures. So way over to the right, we see when students were asked about uh, at the outset of college, the ex uh, whether or not this was a yes or no question, did they participate in community service while in high school? 
I mean, an overwhelming uh, proportion of the sample, 82% said, yes, I did. When we look to the left of that, we ask about it in two different ways during their first year, whether it was voluntary or required community service, we see those numbers drop quite a bit. And for any of you, data folk out there, uh, there are students who are in both camps, right? So they have done both voluntary and required a community service. So you can't just add these together and say, oh, it looks the same, um, right? There is a, actually a significant amount of students who are in both of those camps as well. So we know that their engagement drops during their first year of college. We also know during the first year of college, civic engagement differs across religious or secular groups. So, you know, to the point that was raised earlier about the motivation to engage in some of this work, one of the things that we can suggest is that we, although we don't yet know why, we hope that some of our qualitative findings uncover this, we certainly know that groups are engaging very differently. And I wanna break this down a little bit. So these colored bars, what, you, what they represent are different worldview uh, groups. So worldview majority in blue, these are uh, folks who self-identified from a Christian denomination. Uh, so they identify religiously and from a Christian tradition. Worldview minority in orange are folks who identify religiously but not within a Christian tradition. Non-religious by its name are people who explicitly do not identify religiously including agnostics, atheists, secular humanists, etc. Another worldview is um, basically anyone that doesn't fit those three categories. These are usually students who write in something other than what is provided. So the first thing we can see, uh, the variety of civic engagement opportunities to the left, we see that with both required and voluntary community service, for example, um, overwhelmingly this is worldview majority or folks who are religious and from Christian denominations uh, participating in that. Um, we see a pretty substantial drop off um, with some of our other groups, for instance. When we get down and look at service project and brainstorming solutions to societal issues, for instance, we see a little bit more of a difference um, as well. So in, in, interestingly, right, these bars represent the proportion of that worldview that's engaged. So we can also get a sense, um, right, of, folks who are not engaging in this work. I've chosen to highlight the folks who are engaged in the work, but right, what we can, uh, what we can ascertain from this is that quite a few students are actually not engaging in this, um, and it differs according to students' religious and secular identification. The third thing, and I'm only gonna present one more after this, so don't worry, but the, uh, the third thing that I'll present uh, relates more to our pluralism measures. Um, I mentioned that I was going to highlight two uh, the first I'll highlight is commitment to interfaith leadership and service. So on the ideal survey, this is actually measured using the four items over to the left. I'm not going to drill down on that, but it's just so you understand what we mean by commitment to interfaith leadership and service. Students rate the extent to which they agree with these items on a five-point scale. We add all those scores up and we sort them into thirds. So the highest possible score is a 20, the lowest possible score is a five, and we divide that up into thirds and essentially assign students into high level, medium level, or low level of commitment, okay? And what we see is almost three-fourths of students at the end of their first year uh, report a very high level of commitment to interfaith leadership and service. So you can see, again, how we're measuring that. Uh, this was pretty profound. It's pretty encouraging. It certainly doesn't speak to their behavior, right? This is about their commitment, right? Their sort of attitude around it. Um, we're, we'll be interested to collect uh, data this year that actually asks about the extent to which they've done some of this. The second thing I'll explain, we see a different story when we ask them about global citizenship. So same kind of idea, the four items that we, the four items that we use to measure global citizenship are included. Um, we sum up those scores, we sort them into high, medium, and low. And again, we can see this time a pretty even split between high and medium. And so students relative to the global citizenship measure um, which is essentially a measure of how much they understand or thinking about global issues um, and uh, taking steps to improve the lives of others, et cetera. Um, we see a big drop off, uh, right? Many more students are in that medium level. Um, this could be for a variety of reasons. Given time, I won't get into that, but if folks have questions, I'm happy to elaborate. Um, and so we're wondering right now, I know it looks like a couple of folks have chatted in, um, but if you have questions about any of these findings, if you want to know more nuance, or even if you just want to share what resonates with you, we welcome you to be able to uh, contribute that to the chat. Thank you. I'm just responding to Katie, um, but I'll, uh, I'll just share a few ideas. Um, Katie asked, you know, 
and mention that there are two Christian affiliated student organizations that are rarely volunteering um, in, and, and are not active partners in civic engagement and just wanting to see if there were resources or, or things to consider in that space. Um, and Katie, I'll definitely follow up um, in an email and maybe we can set up a phone call to dive further into the conversation because I think and always context matters, right? And so um, thinking about framing, thinking about how we are inviting students into the space, are we asking them to come into our space that already has um, a perception that it's uh, unwelcoming to certain values or groups or affinity groups? Um, and so all that can, can play a role on why perhaps these student organizations aren't volunteering or in engaging in this space. Um, so um, Katie, I will definitely follow up with, uh, with an email and we will continue this conversation um, further. So thank you so much for posing that, but that, those are just some quick ideas to maybe consider. Um, so with that, um, at IFYC, and I'm sure in your roles, um, we like to make data-driven decisions and um, we, we, we encourage our partners to assess and to interview and really think about the spaces that they're creating. And so we've provided some methodology, some frameworks, some of the data and the spaces that we're in um, here in the U.S. In, in just nationally, right? So just kind of help frame that conversation. But we also want to provide a space for application, right? And so I've asked a colleague and friend, um, uh, Mandy from Carnegie Mellon, um, just to share with us some of her programmatic initiatives that are engaging exactly what we're talking about and how she's doing this, you know, um, just to maybe prompt some ideas. But more importantly, it's really important for us at IFYC to, to share research and theory and frameworks, but to also begin thinking about the application and how this becomes a, a tangible resource program initiative that we can cultivate on our various campuses. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to share some of our interfaith efforts at Carnegie Mellon. My name is Mandy Best. I'm a House Fellow and the Coordinator of Spirituality and Interfaith Initiatives at CMU. That means part of my work is supporting first-year students in one of our residential communities, and the other part of my work is spent in religious and spiritual life. Um, today, I'm just going to quickly highlight some of our um, efforts for increasing religious literacy and interfaith cooperation at Carnegie Mellon. So I'd like to um, especially highlight some of our student-led initiatives, um, and then one of our annual signature events that I think has been particularly impactful. Um, also, I think it's important for me to note that we're about one mile from the Tree of Life Synagogue in Squirrel Hill, um, where there was the horrific act of violence against people of faith about a month ago. So that's our context at Carnegie Mellon. Um, until about two years ago, all of our student-led interfaith initiatives at CMU were spearheaded by a grassroots group of individual students from a variety of our religious student organizations. Um, now I'm happy to report that we have two formalized student groups which share the common goal of encouraging interfaith cooperation and dialogue in our community. The Interfaith Spirituality Embassy, or INSPIRE, um, which you can see on the top left of my slide, seeks to create environments which encourage both individual spiritual growth and difficult and deep dialogues between individuals. And then the other group is the Council of Religious Students, which is on the bottom right, and they strive to increase religious literacy on campus and be a voice for our students of faith at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and that group actually just this week got the green light to become an officially recognized student organization, so we're pretty excited about um, sort of that legitimacy for this group. Um, both, both of these groups host events for their individual membership, but they also partner to plan events for the greater CMU community. Two of their signature events have been the Interfaith Thanksgiving Dinner and the Spring Interfaith Forum. Our uh, Interfaith Thanksgiving Dinner is a gathering where students can share a meal and discuss their individual religious beliefs and practices. This year before the meal, several students presented a reading, a prayer, or a song from their faith, which I thought was a really nice layer of meaning for everybody in attendance. Uh, you'll see the whole group in the photo there. I am teeny tiny on the left-hand side, 
and you'll see my son Jack and his carrier um, on the table beside me there. Um, the other event um, is the Spring Interfaith Forum, which is an annual discussion about a difficult topic presented by a panel of leaders in three different religions. Um, this year will be the fourth Interfaith Forum at CMU. I don't know what topic the students are going to pick, but our previous three topics have been good and evil, death, and politics. So um, our students aren't really messing around when they choose the theme of that, and I'll be excited to see how they top themselves this year. Uh, I'm also in that photo, I'm also teeny tiny in the back, I was the moderator of that event. So if you squint, you can see me. Um, the last photo in the middle of this slide was taken a few days after the Tree of Life shooting, um, when students from each of these groups rallied to create signs of peace to place around our campus. Each sign included a quote about peace or love from a variety of religious and philosophical texts. Um, in addition to this just being incredibly touching and timely, I thought this initiative was important to include um, because it came about organically from the sense of mission that these students feel to create a community of unity and peace on our campus. So my next slides are all about Ask Me Anything Day, which is the culminating event of our annual Spirituality Development Month. Throughout the month of November, we highlight events from a variety of our religious and spiritual student organizations. You can see some of the events on the poster on the left side of the screen. Um, Ask Me Anything Day is an attempt to open the door to conversation about religion. On this day, several students, faculty, and staff wear buttons, which look like the blue and black picture there, um, which say, I am, insert religion here, ask me anything. Um, we also hosted a table in our university center with food and hot beverages and conversation starters. This year we used post-it notes as a means of asking and answering questions about religion. We had three prompts. The first was, what is something you wish people knew about your religion, which um, folks answered on the yellow post-its. The second prompt was, what is one question you have about a particular religion? And I think they used light blue for that um, post-it. And then and the third was just, um, if you can answer one of these questions, answer it. Um, I learned a lot through this activity. I thought it would be helpful to show you some of the things that our students wish others knew about their religion. Finally, I wanted to include um, one particular exchange that happened on our display this year. Um, one student asked on the Jewish section of the display board, how has the Tree of Life shooting affected your practice? Um, and another student answered um, on the right side of the screen, and it's kind of hard to read, so I'll read it. After the shooting, there is more police presence in our places of worship. This is problematic for Jews of color who don't look traditionally Jewish or Eastern European because they are being discriminated from their practice and religion. I want less weaponization of temples. This exchange, along with several other interactions, large and small over the last month, have confirmed what I already knew, which is that religion continues to be an important part of our students' identities and a big part of our society. As educators, we have a duty to create welcoming environments, which allow and encourage students to practice their own religion and be curious and supportive of others. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm really excited about this work and I'd love to talk more with any of you. I'll put my email address in the chat box, um, or you can find our relatively new Instagram account at CMU Interfaith. Thank you all so much for having me. Thank you, Mandy. Um, thank you for highlighting those uh, examples of civic engagement and interfaith cooperation, um, and just highlighting um, some of the research that Lisa shared about the importance of relationship, and I'll add to that, that proactive relationship. Um, so uh, thank you both very much for, for sharing that with us today. Um, as, as our time draws near, 60 minutes always goes by so quickly, um, I do want to spend just a minute highlighting some of IFYC resources that connect to the conversation that we had today. Um, so there's a ton of resources on our website, um, but if you just go to ifyc.org slash resources, you can search for the ones that you'll need. Um, and, you know, as well as like curriculum or research and best practices, depending on how you're trying to frame your work or programmatic aspects, right? If you want to see some templates of how to embed interfaith mm -hmm. into the work that you're already doing. So there's lots of spaces, lots of wonderful resources that are online. They're all um, free and accessible. Um, so please utilize them. 
Um, I want to highlight the bridge curriculum because uh, Lisa lifted it up in this webinar specifically talking about social capital, uh, bonded capital and cohesion and how civic um, engagement can lead or the positive influences of um, interfaith cooperation. And so um, if you want to spend a little bit more time in that, please jump on our website and look through the bridge curriculum. We're also leading an accountability group. So if you're in that space where you want to use the bridge curriculum to embed to engage worldview in your work, um, please jump online, sign up for the accountability group and work with other practitioners in civic spaces or in multicultural affairs or dean of students or in the various roles on campus, first year experienced mm -hmm. faculty and think through the bridge curriculum and embedding it into the work that you're doing. Great, and finally, also wanted to um, lift up two other resources and ways to learn more about uh, some of our research. Uh, the first is our findings from our campus interfaith inventory, uh, our latest, uh, this was just released last month. Um, it really features specific campus practices and um, highlights actually what's going on um, on our campuses. Um, and is this particular, this is a second report out of the Campus Interfaith Inventory. In particular, it draws from findings from that national survey uh, uh, from educators, administrators on campuses, what they are and are not doing. It puts it in conversation with some of the ideals findings and practices that are happening on specific campuses. And it actually does it all through the lens of a fictitious first year college student. So as this fictitious, you'll see her right there actually on the blue uh, report on the far right. That's our fictitious college student. Um, uh, it, so it's uh, these leadership practices and innovative practices through a student's lens, but actually how it unfolds and the implications. It's a really compelling report. Um, the other one, I'm of course very partial to, um, the IDEALS, uh, the latest report from the IDEALS uh, National Project. Uh, this lifts up uh, the 10 most promising practices that have been shown to be the most influential, uh, either climate conditions on campus or specific educational co-curricular and curricular practices uh, that relate to students' learning and development. It talks about formal and informal engagement, curricular and co-curricular spaces, the role of staff and faculty, interaction across difference among students. It talks about all of that. Um, I've put the IFR yc.org slash first year. All of the ideal stuff is, is on there, the webinars that we've done in the past, uh, and our reports. So if you want to learn more, definitely check those out. Uh, you can also stay in touch uh, with Janet and me. Um, we love working with campus partners. We love expanding our network um, and meeting new folks. Um, we also invite you, if you have questions, uh, we have a few minutes left and we're going to turn it back over to Marisol in just a moment. Uh, to provide some closing remarks, but if you have questions, thoughts, please feel free to chat them um, and we'll keep an eye on that as well. Um, Janet, do you want to say any last words? Just really grateful for your time. We know you can be in any place uh, this afternoon or mornings. I, I noticed there's some California folks on the call. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for being in this space with us. Um, we hope that it's prompted um, some some ideas or if you're still kind of in inception mode please reach out we'd love to serve as a thought partner with you and and help you think through civic engagement and interfaith cooperation and the positive changes that it, it can lead to on your college campus and before i turn it over to marisol in just a moment i also want to echo janet's comments and i want to go back to the very beginning of our time together and remind folks that almost three quarters of our participants on today's webinar mentioned that they were not including or integrating religious, spiritual, and secular identities in their work. So we certainly hope that, um, you know, familiarizing yourselves with Interfaith Youth Corps, our work, why we do our work, but more importantly, how it promotes, I think, some of the same civic outcomes that you're trying to work toward. So as Janet mentioned, the more we can be in conversation and the more we can help you think about ways to integrate that um, using your existing uh, practices and, and ways of understanding we really welcome that. So with that said, I'll turn it back over to Marisol, uh, but thank you all so much. Great. Thank you so much, Janet and Lisa, Mandy and Natalie, for um, a wonderful and engaging webinar. I think it's really important as we're thinking about civic engagement and uh, diversity in all kinds of uh, ways that uh, religious diversity in the way that we make that connection between civic engagement um, and religious or non-religious affiliation um, and have diverse spaces on our college campuses to really engage these multiple identities that our students are working with and coming into our colleges and universities with um, 
So the more we can collaborate as Campus Compact, as Interfaith Youth Corps helps to build the good work that's happening on our college campuses uh, across the country and, and the world. So again, I wanna thank you all uh, for attending. I wanna thank our um, panelists for an engaging uh, webinar. And then um, you will be receiving an evaluation in your inbox shortly. So please uh, fill that out. We um, will be sharing that. Um, and it's a way for us to improve our practice as well and hear from you about um, the ways that we can improve this work, but also the benefits um, that these webinars have for our members. Um, in addition to that, I want to remind folks that uh, Campus Compact this year, this 2019, has its regional conferences. I want to promote our three regional conferences. Uh, the first one coming up in 2019 is Continuums of Service, uh, our Western Region uh, Conference, which is happening March 6th through 8th in San Diego. Um, our Eastern Regional Com uh, Campus Compact Conference takes place March 25th through 27th it's in Providence, Rhode Island. And our Midwest Campus Compact Conference takes place in Minneapolis, May 30th through 31st. And until next time, thanks all. Bye-bye.